Welcome, everyone. Thank you for joining this Global Investigative Journalism Network webinar. My name is Sheila Coronel, and I am Professor of Journalism and Director of the Stabile Center for Investigative Journalism at Columbia University's Graduate School of Journalism in New York. I'm also the co-founder of the Philippine Center for Investigative Journalism, which was established shortly after the fall of the Philippine strongman, Ferdinand Marcos. The United States election is just five days away, and the issue of democratic recession is on the minds of everyone who is following these elections, and that means most journalists. Um, according to Freedom House, this is the 15th straight year when democracy has been on the decline. And for the first time in five years, more countries are moving towards autocracy than gaining democracy. Right now, it is estimated that half the people on the planet live in democracies. And if India continues in a downward slide, only a third of humanity will be ruled by a democratic regime. And who knows about the United States? Journalists have been at the front lines of this anti-democratic backlash. COVID-19 has made it worse in many countries where governments have used the pandemic as a cover to further restrict human rights and free speech. We are dealing not only with growing hatred about what we do, but also with a sustained attack on the very idea of verifiable fact. What is the role of a watchdog press when democracy and rule of law are slipping away? This is what we're going to discuss today. And in this GIJN webinar, we bring together three extraordinary journalists who've reported from Russia, Egypt, and South Africa, all of whom have championed independent media when democracy in their countries fell under siege. I'd now like to introduce you to our speakers who have reflected on the role of independent watchdog journalism um, under challenging circumstances and will share strategies for staying effective and true to the highest standards of our profession. Let me start with Lina Atala, who is a co-founder and chief editor of Madame Masser, a, a Cairo-based news website that is one of the last remaining voices of independent media in Egypt today. Lydia has written for Reuters, the Cairo Times, and the Daily Star, among others, and also for the Egypt Independent, which was shut down by the government. This year, Time Magazine named her one of the most influential people of 2020. Masha Gessen is a staff writer for The New Yorker and author of 12 books, including Surviving Autocracy and the National Book Award winning The Future is History, How Tot Totalitarianism Reclaimed Russia. Shortly after the 2016 election, Marsha wrote the influential article, Autocracy Rules for Survival. If you haven't read it yet, it's up for free in the New York Review of Books website. Marsha also teaches at Bard College in New York. Nick Doss cut his teeth as an investigative and political reporter in South Africa, and then went on to become editor in chief of the Mail and Guardian and chief content and editorial officer at the Henderson Times. Until recently, he was Deputy Executive Director of Human Rights Watch, and he serves on the boards of um, investigative reporting stars like Coda Story, Ama Bungani in South Africa, and the Bekisisa Center for Health Journalism. Before we start, a little bit of information about the Global in Investigative Journalism Network. For those of you who are not familiar with GIJN, it's the largest global network of nonprofit investigative journalism organizations. GIJN currently has 203 member organizations in 80 countries, but it works with journalists everywhere in nonprofits, in commercial organizations, and with freelancers. It has an extensive range of resources and tip sheets to help journalists worldwide, including a new reporting guide on investigating the US elections. We'll put those in the chat box and please also check out other resources at gijn.org. We also want to hear from you in the audience. So please send written questions and messages in the Q&A box and we'll get to as many of them as we can later. You can start asking questions from now and in any language as your questions will be translated. When the speakers are finished, GIJN's Eunice Ao will join us on the screen to moderate the questions. Finally, please note, we will be recording this session for posting later on YouTube. So let's start. Um, let's start with 
the moment we are in. We're talking about democratic regression and that takes a lot of forms, all the way from creeping authoritarianism to more developed or extreme forms that has, man, you know, like in, in Russia or China, and that, you know, others, other forms that are now being manifested in many longstanding democracies, including the United States. There is a consensus that there is a global tide of increasing uh, authoritarian rule that is affecting most of the planet. And it generally means a retreat from democratic norms, the rule of law, the erosion of civility and political discourse, and of course, the removal of protections for independent reporting and for independent speech. This makes the journalism that we do, GIJN members do, particularly difficult and creates major challenges and risks for journalists all around the world. So I'd like to ask all our speakers to start by thinking into the countries that they know best and that they've had experience reporting in and to think about how we should be responding at this moment to the challenges all around us, what strategies and skills we need to do, we need to have, what topics and issues we need to talk about, how we restructure the world of media and information. So I'll give each of our speakers about five to eight minutes to, um, to talk about these issues. So let's let's give Masha Gessen, let's have Masha first um, to speak, to talk about the countries she knows best, Masha. Hi, thank you for having me. It's an honor to be here. Um, so yes, I have the very strange experience of having been a, a political reporter and editor in Russia for about 20 years, and then returning to the US when I had to leave Russia in 2013, and very soon um, you know, watching the um, democratic regression uh, uh, in, in this country as well. <clears throat> and I've obviously spent a lot of time thinking and writing about transferable lessons. Not everything is portable, not everything is applicable. Obviously, uh, things that I learned in Russia were specific to that culture and that history. And the United States is different, but it's actually been shocking and incredibly disheartening to see how many lessons are applicable to the situation that we're in now here. Um, and because the, the topic here is investigative journalism, what I actually wanted to focus on was the particular difficulties that I had when I was writing my book about Putin in, um, I was reporting in, in 20, between 20, 2008 and 2011, it was, it was published in 2012. And what I kept coming up against again and again were the limits of being able to do investigative work in a country that um, where the responsible agencies, uh, law enforcement agencies, investigative agencies, government agencies did not do their jobs, were not transparent, and in fact, often were doing the opposite of their jobs by falsifying records, falsifying history, and making records inaccessible. And the very simple things, or what, what seems like a, you know, a simple thing when you're, when you're in a very complicated situation, the simple things that I had been taught to do as a young journalist in the United States, which was, for example, if you have a court record, that is your final record. Right? If there's been a court ruling, that's a fact. Right? Um, those things were, were up for grabs. And I think if you are an honest and responsible journalist, you can't not have a queasy feeling as you're writing because, because that ability to, to rely on a solid record that was created for you by professionals, that ability is taken away from you. And as, um, as hard as I tried to, you know, to only put in the Putin book things that, that were corroborated, that, uh, that were, you know, that had all, all sorts of caveats around them. I still had that queasy feeling when the book came out that so much of it was in the end 
connecting the dots in a way a conspiracy theorist would con connect the dots rather than connecting the dots that would have been there um, sort of more solidly on paper had the relevant agencies investigated um, things that I was looking at, for example, suspicious deaths, right? Uh, or the apartment building explosions in Moscow in the south of Russia <clears throat> in 1999. But what I think ultimately gave me a little bit of sort of certainty that I was doing the right thing. And this I think is, is a portable lesson and a, and a super important one, right? Um, was just having a, a long memory. Now what passes for a long memory in an autocracy is, is actually a pretty short memory by historical standards, right? Um, and I'll, I'll give a very simple example. Uh, in the Putin book, I had a chapter on poisonings. At the time in 2012, it was really going out on a limb to claim that, or to suggest that there was a connection between the Putin administration and a number of suspicious deaths that may have been poisonings. We now know for certain that that was right. <clears throat> um, I was still taking a risk. What, um, what made that risk more justifiable was that I was able to reach back into the 1990s and to trace some suspicious deaths from back then and sort of link, um, link a series of poisonings to uh, deaths that might have been poisonings. Um, as we have learned just in the last year, right, the death that I reached back to in the 1990s was actually death from Novichok, which is the agent that everybody has heard about now. No one had heard about when I was writing the book. Um, and, um, you know, when I first heard it, I thought, oh my God, what a stroke of luck. But it was also a matter of just very meticulous record keeping and sort of historical uh, the keeping of history, which is part of what I think journalists become responsible for in periods like this. Autocracies thrive on creating information chaos, right? We're constantly trying to work in a state of haze. It's like um, a comparison that I make in, in, my, in my book on surviving autocracy, uh, which is a book on the Trump administration, is a comparison to living in a very polluted environment where it's like you can't even see very well, right? Because of all the particles of, 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 of pollution that are in the air. And every so often it's like it rains or, or the wind go, blows in the other direction. And for a second or for a day, you have the sense of, 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 of clarity that is incredibly restful, right? Because things come into focus for a minute. So I think that um, it's, my, it's useful to keep that in mind, right? That we're all working under those conditions of incredible duress and working to, um, it says that the, the translation, the interpretation is not coming through well. I'm just seeing a Russian comment in the chat. <clears throat> I'm going to try to slow down a little bit. Uh, we're all working under conditions of information haze that is intentional. And record keeping and putting things into a chronological and historical narrative is our best antidote to that, I think. And I'll give, uh, to, 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 to finish up, a quick example from our current stories in the United States. I think one of the most important stories about the Trump administration, one of its most um, egregious violations of human rights, but also one of the most important records that we will need to keep in the post-Trump world, because it will eventually come, um, is the record of the policy of the separation of children from their families at, at the border <clears throat> that was instituted starting in 2017. And I just said 2017, and for people who follow, who follow that story, that may seem surprising because we started covering that story later. And now various sort of compelling narratives emerge. And now this is another thing, is that in a situation of information haze, it's very difficult to resist compelling narratives. 
it's always really tempting to write a Hollywood story, right? Where there's like a guy or much less often a woman who is who tried to resist, who was who tried to be a force for for good um, in uh, in a criminal administration. And so recently there was a story that came out that uh, Rod Rosenstein, a top official in the Justice Department, was that kind of person who tried to resist that policy. That story is a historic in the very short story of, uh, you know, history of this policy, which is just three years. If we tra trace it back to when the, story, uh, the policy began, the position that he held when he says he objected, et cetera, et cetera, we will see that that narrative doesn't hold up. And it is essential, right, to, 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 to keep those stories uh, and to keep those accurate records. We will, you know, all we can, we can do as journalists to resist autocracy is be truthful and as accurate as we can possibly be. Um, and that doesn't always make for compelling and neat narratives, but it does make for the truth. Thank you. Thank you, Masha. I'd like to ask Lena to follow on on what Masha has said in terms of, you know, you operate in the same situation of information chaos or information haze. What is your role? What is specifically has been Madame Masser's role at this time in Egypt? Uh, thank you, Sheila. It's, um, I'm also very honored to be here. Um, and it's great to follow up on um, what uh, Masha started um, um, telling us. Um, I think in response to the question of, you know, what should be our responsibility with, um, with then conditions uh, uh, like those we are living through right now of not only information haze, but information scarcity in some cases. Um, and this is what we try to do at Madamasu is to basically uh, focus more or less on three axes. Uh, one is basically to just shed light on this information that is completely blacked out. Um, so the stories that, you know, the authorities uh, don't want us to publish or to write or to investigate or to, to do anything about. Um, and so that's, uh, that's one stream. Uh, we are very keen and active um, on, um, on, on following. Another stream is to basically address uh, that information and these uh, narratives that are engineered in such a way where they come out to us distorted, right? Um, and the way to go about this, and it goes back to the antidote that Masha spoke to us about, is, is, is to basically utilize different tools to address this question of distortion. So giving different alternative contexts that get obliterated a lot of the times. And, and I really like the idea of the, the historicity and the different histories that should go into, um, into narratives in order to understand, uh, to locate a truth somewhere there. Um, uh, another tool is to include voices uh, with solid information that could, um, that could basically clear out the distortion uh, somehow. And most importantly, empirics and information and, um, and, 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 and raw information as much as possible. And, uh, and I say this in the context of our work at MEDA, we had the choice as a young media some seven years ago with very little resources, not to go into news gathering and not to go into, and, and to rather go into this, you know, slow mode of analysis and um and um and and yeah analysis basically but we chose very clearly to go for news gathering because we feel that we need the empirics we need the information in order to be able to analyze and we feel that there is such a scarcity there is such a deficit um, of information in um in the media landscape right now uh that it's very hard to start constructing analytical uh, narratives that basically bear witness to the period that we're living through. So, so that's a second uh, stream we again actively walk in at Madame Monster. And then finally, an important uh, 
direction is also one where we're not constantly reactive in the sense that we're very conscious obviously of how the news work and a lot of the times um, we find ourselves in this place where we are reacting to something the authorities have done um, either by um, providing a counter narrative or you know finding alternative information that give us um, a different picture from that that is being uh, sort of spread on mass uh, but at the same time, we're very aware that while doing this, there's always a possibility of overlooking other stories uh, that are equally important to be told, especially in a context that is highly centralized, like Egypt, for example, where, you know, all eyes are on Cairo. Does this mean uh, that all of Egypt is Cairo? Obviously not. So that's why, for example, we have a lot of interest in, um, in locating narratives um, in the margins, in the countryside, in community, in marginal communities, be them ethnic or geographical and, and, and so on. So being able to also look elsewhere and to sort of widen um, um, the, 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 the scope of attention to other possibilities, um, because that's also, that's also truth making, right? It's not just, um, it's not just that which we need to counter or to oppose, but it's also all the other things uh, that we are oftentimes too preoccupied to address. Um, and it's very important in a context like ours to do all of this in a consistent manner. And I like to think of consistency also in relation of, uh, with survival in the sense that um, I think the reason why our audience has been growing and the reason why uh, people have been coming to us, including the unusual suspects uh, who are, you know, outside, you know, the very uh, broad um, constituency of progressive pro-democracy um, uh, readers, is that there's a sense that we have been doing the same thing over and over and over, and we haven't been really uh, changing our editorial standards. Um, and we have been really uh, sort of evading the, the constant uh, accusations of, um, of being partisan or, or, or you know, being pro-West or being pro-whatever um, by basically being very information and very empirical in any analysis we provide. Um, so this consistency is very important over time. I think you build uh, you, you build that credibility over time. And at the same time, and this is where I like to link it to the question of survival, I must say that uh, we are not too obsessed with survival in the sense that it's important to be consistent and to do what we're doing. But if our consistency means that there is that story that we need to tell that might compromise um, the, you know, the, the, the life um, of this project altogether, uh, and we have all what it takes to report that story, the choice would be to report that story, not uh, to choose uh, survival, because survival becomes a void notion. It's almost an apolitical thing. Um, and I know that it's a contested view and, you know, we can, we can have different philosophies about, you know, survival as a form of resistance. But I think in our line of work right now, um, it's important to be here now um, with, um, with, the, the, with the standards that we have put out there for ourselves. The negotiation comes on the level of, you know, how we tell, how we utilize certain vocabulary, you know, language is a very promising field for us uh, to play within. Um, but uh, the standards of what we report on and how we report on them do not change. So this would be in a nutshell, um, you know, what we think our role should be in a moment like this. Thank you, Lena. I'd like to go back on that point of survival, but let's go to Nick first. Nick, do you agree with Lena and Marsha that at a time like this, the journalist's main role is record keeping, filling in the information voids, finding some clarity in the chaos, in the hope I think I'm overstretching what Marsha is saying here in the hope that accountability will come later. I think that 
I completely agree with that role. And it's something that I, of course, saw among my Human Rights Watch colleagues as well, that building the record was critically important and that eventually you would see Bosco and Tanganda convicted of war crimes or Hisan Habre. But I think there's more to it. And I think they both alluded to this in slightly different ways. There's more to it simply than the record. It's also about preserving the capacity for a democratic imagination and for the idea that a democratic environment can thrive. And there's more, the accountability is a big piece of that. I mean, Masha spoke to, to that feeling of when the rain comes and the particles clear out of the air and you can breathe. And I think the moments of accountability, even in a system that's under pressure, can provide that across the wider um, environment. But I think it's also very important for journalism, whether it's, you know, wherever on the spectrum or in the mix of different democracies under pressure, you find yourself for journalism to model and open and provide the idea of democratic health and democratic thriving. Um, and one of the things that I've, I've felt in, in my own career, both as a reporter and an editor, is that we need to be very clear with ourselves and our readers about our purpose in doing that. And I, I've, I've felt at times in my own career, like I've not been as explicit either with myself or with our audience about how we see our role in relation to a vision of democracy and the democracy that we're fostering and part of. Um, so we would operate from a set of fairly unreflected and unexamined assumptions about uh, playing a watchdog role or securing accountability um, or, or even just that we are a constitutionally protected species um, in, in any democracy. And I think to fully think through what it means in your particular circumstances uh, to be a bulwark for democracy, to be a resource for the democratic imagination, as well as being uh, the provider of a, of a record um, and, and, a, and a capacity for accountability that both as individuals and as societies we need is important to do. And I think that there are, are layers to what that looks like. Um, one of the things that I think really we struggled with in, in South African journalism, and I'll speak briefly to my experience there, was that we uh, came out of apartheid, a press that had very mixed relationships with the uh, apartheid regime. The paper that I edited was very much a part of resistance to apartheid and understood its purpose before 1990 fundamentally as a journalism contributing to the struggle against apartheid. Um, Others were in all a whole range of mixed up places on the spectrum between actively forming part of apartheid's information infrastructure or ambivalently contesting it. And when we emerged into democracy, I think many of us thought that we simply had to get on with being journalists in a normal way and in a normative way, uh, which meant we would investigate corruption and abuses of power, for example, um, and that would be enough. And we came under in a single party dominant system, um, the paper that the Mail and Guardian was, had clearly decided fairly early on that uh, corruption was one major risk to South Africa's democratic health. And importantly, was a major risk to all of the rights in the Bill of Rights, including social and economic rights like education, healthcare, water, and so on. Um, but we hadn't ever really explained that to readers and possibly even to ourselves. So what it sounded like and felt like to a lot of people as the paper pivoted to becoming a tough anti-corruption investigative paper was that we were using the tools of investigative journalism against a government that was now legitimate, where in the past we had used them against a government that was illegitimate. And that meant that when that government became uncomfortable with what we were doing, they had a whole lot of weaponry ready to hand to use against us. And they used you know, the usual rhetoric about our partisanship, as Lena said, um, about the lack of racial diversity and transformation in newsrooms, a legitimate criticism, in fact. Um, they used lawsuits, you know, launched by their cronies, defamation lawsuits launched by their cronies to try and quiet us. Um, and they sought to stigmatize the whole work of journalism um, by, by association. And I think the fact that we hadn't thought through and explained what our commitment to a certain vision of democracy was, 
and that we didn't articulate that broadly enough in what and how we investigated, you know, weakened us for a time. Um, we actually redesigned the ethical code of the paper to bake in uh, a constitutional vision, an anti-racist vision, um, a vision about um, people's broad rights to the fundamental kind of ethical practices um, of the paper as, as one step to do that. We often would explain to readers, you know, why we handled a particular, took on a particular story or why we handled it in a particular way. Um, and I've seen that a little more in the States recently. For example, Dean Baquet wrote an explanatory note to go with the, the Times' uh, investigation of Trump's taxes. And these are small, simple things, but I think very powerful in establishing both for readers and for reporters what it is we do and why we do it and how we play this, this role um, in the democratic space. One of the things that I found very challenging uh, when I worked in India was that you had huge media businesses, very successful media businesses, very powerful, that were built around the scaffold of a democratic idea of independent journalism, but that had often seen that scaffold kind of emptied out of its real animating content. So the, the real will to take on power, to use the resources of those institutions and their social place to sustain the idea of a democratic and plural and accountable India um, had been weakened by the fact that very often they were simply aligned with either commercial or political interests on the part of their owners. So that journalistic excuses were given for decisions which were not journalistic. And in fact, that aided and weakened um, the attacks on the press that came from the Indian right wing and that have, that have formed so much of a part um, of, of, of India's retreat recently from providing space for independent journalism. And this is despite the brilliance and commitment of so many uh, individual in Indian journalists um, and editors. So I think that in addition to um, the really important points about documentation and the critical point about having a long memory um, of knowing that corrupt elites are small, uh, networks are small, that you will find connections over the years, that you need to transmit memory between you know, more longstanding reporters and, and younger ones, thinking very actively and articulating where we fit into the project of sustaining democracy, whether it's a little flickering flame you know, or a healthier blaze uh, is, is a really important part of this discussion. Thank you, Nick. Um, certainly the Demo democratic project or the democracy project is under siege right now. And I'd like to focus on some of these challenges, challenges also of, as you say, I like very much your idea of you know, having, building a democratic imagination, but how do we do that? at a time when there is so much disinformation and propaganda, when the public space has been so poisoned by lies and untruths, and where on a daily basis, you know, governments or heads of state are basically making up facts or, or manufacturing lies at warp speed. How, how do we make these voices of democracy and of accountability heard in this, in this moment. So all of us, I think here have come from countries that have under, underwent you know, that transition from authoritarian rule to some sort of democracy. Lena, you were a child of the Arab Spring and then back you know, to some sort of regression. And we kind of have memories. And what, what have we learned from those years that we can use now at this moment when the challenges are far different from the ones we saw in the 1990s or even the early 2000s. Um, Masha, I'll give the floor to you first. Um, let me think about this for a second. So, um, you know, how do we, uh, let me focus on the part of your question about how we keep the democratic imagination alive in our work, because I think that's, uh, I'm really grateful for Nick, to Nick for bringing that into the conversation. Um, and I think it is, it is the most important and the most difficult question. And there are a couple of ways to answer it. One, and this is certainly something that when used in Russia a lot during the better days of the 1990s, 
um, to act as if we could hold power to account. Um, I think, I mean, it's an imaginative step. It's an incredibly important imaginative step. You know? uh, because there you are feeling like you're never going to get them to speak to you. You know, you, you go to court, you ask the prosecutor to identify themselves to you and they say no, uh, right? Uh, and, um, and how in that situation do you empower yourself to think, to imagine for a second that, that you can hold power to account, to account? But it's your job, right? And you imagine that, um, that, this is, that this is your position, that you can in fact do it. Um, and it's an imaginative leap that I think can be incredibly powerful in sort of repositioning um, the journalist, but also in reframing the story. Right? Um, when you stop being the supplicant in relationship to, to power, which is of course a position that, you know, in some ways, uh, even countries that we think of as functioning, functioning democracies often place journalists into, right? It's what jo Joan Didion called the deferential stance uh, uh, toward, um, and toward the power in Washington, right? So, so you leave that position of supplicant and you imagine to engage with the position of somebody who has the power to hold power to account. I think that that's, that's one important exercise. Another important exercise, and this is something I think about a lot, is just remember the future. Nothing lasts forever, and this isn't going to last forever either. And part of our responsibility is to take into the future only the things that we're willing to live with in the future. Right? Um, and, and I think, you know, that sounds very abstract, but I think uh, there's a way in which can, it can inform every story. Right? This is the record we're taking with us into the future. That's a huge responsibility, but it's also a responsibility that 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 contains within it, uh, you know, this 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 the moral imperative of hope. There will be a time when what we wrote now matters a great deal, even if we feel now like no one reads this, and like you know, like we and the people who hold, who have usurped power exist in entirely different realities. Uh, and what we write is never going to, you know, to, 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 to act as a lever on that power. Eventually it will matter. It matters what we record. Lina, um, you are working among all of us here in this panel under the most trying circumstances. Uh, a few months ago, your office was raided, you were detained, you were under constant threat. What, what keeps you going? Reflecting on what Marsha said, very inspirational, Marsha. I'm becoming teary-eyed just, just thinking about it in terms of what people like Lena are going through. Does what Marsha say, say resonate with you? Very much so. I think my heart expanded when I heard um, when I heard the point about the future, but I'm not surprised. I think there's an entire book on that. So, uh, um, but um, within the my team, um, because you're constantly referred to as the the, the children of the, the Arab revolutions, as you said, Sheila. Um, but we also happen to be standing out here, sticking and and still trying to do work at a time which you rightly described as quite trying and a time where many people super understandably had to withdraw with a lot of nostalgia to that past of the Arab revolutions, which is the, one of the most amazing things that people of my generation could have ever witnessed. But at the same time, we are very conscious that we can't just operate on this not nostalgia for this fantastic moment. This is also when revolutions become paralyzing in some ways. Um, we actually like to relocate our nostalgia to the future in some ways. Um, so just to add to what Masha has been has been talking is, is, is how can we incorporate, how can we embody a certain sensibility where there is this 
nostalgia for the future and the work we do every day. And this is um, where we try to do two things uh, in an intertwined way. Um, one is, again, as Masha said, trying to create this record of, um, of, of the moment, uh, a record for uh, the moment, a record for us to reckon with, to retrieve and to reckon with. Um, and this is very central to the project. And I had said from the beginning, again, some seven years ago when we started with, with you know, very little resources and not know, and like it was the most perhaps counterintuitive thing one would do in the summer of 2013 back then in Egypt to, you know, start an independent media. Um, my idea was that it's going to be a very difficult summer. It's going, it's a summer of a major political transformation. Um, and we've got to witness it as independent journalists and to create a record for it. If we die shortly after, we would have created a record for that moment. So it happens that we haven't died yet uh, and the record is there. So so I'm happy about that. But I'm also um, giving myself and the people I'm working with the, the right to, um, to think about the future. Uh, and to be nostalgic to the future. And this is where we allow ourselves to be a little bit speculative uh, in, in some of the work we do. In the sense that, again, I, I also appreciate very much um, uh, what Nick said about, you know, opening up that democratic imagination. And I feel oftentimes while we're caught up in, um, in you know, thinking about the dark times, as, as Rex said, uh, we, we tend to we tend to also um, not be able to imagine uh, like being incarcerated in this hegemony of the present uh, while, you know, um, while we're also um, reenacting the fact that they don't want us to dream, right? Um, they want to sever these dreams that we did not yet have. And what we try to do actually, and this I feel is also equally uh, subversive and equally important is, is is to you know is to enact the dreaming in the work we do so so for example just to be a bit concrete because i i feel like i've said many abstract things you know there are major changes that are taking place in in Tahrir square right now and you know there are government uh, government uh, uh, conceived changes um and you know we don't we you know we don't need to go into the details it's it's the kind of changes that uh, basically uh, try to reenact the narrative of the of the vanquisher or the more powerful and so on. Uh, but we do allow ourselves to produce pieces where different people, where we invite different people, urban planners, urban thinkers, artists, um, uh, people who like to walk, um, to basically imagine how they would want uh, the Tahrir Square to look like. Um, and people, you know, have, and we've been like mounting these pieces, these imaginative pieces about how, if, if you are, if you are by chance commissioned to, to, you know, to, to, to do this urban regeneration project for this fantastic historic square, what would you do? And, you know, these pieces have been like, again, you know, expanding hearts uh, and our readers love them so much because you know you just take them away also from the darkness of the moment um, of, of, of reality and and you take them for a second to dream world and I feel that um, we can do that and we can have fun doing that and yeah it's important to, to retrieve the fun in that which we're doing it's not uh, it's not supposed to be uh, all about suffering <laughs> Uh, it, it's really not. And being on the positive side, Nick, I mean, the South African press, for all the faults that you've said, I mean, they did take down a corrupt head of state. The investigative reporting that the South African journalists did was very successful in holding power to account. Right. It, it, it was. And, you know, I don't believe that um, without the investigative reporting that revealed President Zuma's deep, deep implication in a scheme to steal the whole country, essentially, um, 
he would have lost power. The politics were moving. There were other pieces that drove it. None of these things operated alone. But there's no question that the investigative reporting was critical to creating a moment of opportunity for South Africa to look back to the kind of democracy that it wanted to be and to have another go. And there were certainly points um, at, you know, during uh, his tenure at which it felt like what we were doing uh, was useless. Um, and uh, you were reporting every day stories that you would say to yourself, this should bring down the government um, and nothing would happen. And you had to continue and continue and, and believe that the day would come. But I think there are also some practical things. It's not just about doing the work in the traditional sense. I think there are some practical and, and to, to borrow Masha's term, transferable lessons from that experience. One is really strong forensic skills. Um, and I've, you know, if you aren't able to read balance sheets, dig into company records, do that kind of work, it's not fancy. It can sound super complicated and abstruse. It isn't, but deliberately applying yourself to acquiring and transferring uh, those kinds of forensic skills, I think is a really important thing for newsroom leaders to foster. And as a corollary, um, being able to apply them across jurisdictions. And this is one of the many ways in which the kind of collaboration that GIJ and fosters is so important because oftentimes you'll find pieces of information that may be inaccessible uh, in a closed or pressured environment that may pop up somewhere else in a different jurisdiction um, that has different stock exchange listing requirements or different transparency rules um, that, that will enable you to find that. So the, the forensics to build the evidence base was one big piece of that. Um, I think collaboration across organizations within South Africa, not just um, in fact finding a, a model we've seen more and more of, but actually also in publishing uh, was really important because that it meant it was impossible to delegitimize any single outlet um, or make an attack against any single outlet. Having you know, two or three or, or more publishing partners in a consortium also spread some of the load and, and, and made it possible to, to deepen um, people's trust uh, in, in the reporting. And then the, the last thing that I'll say is that I think it's completely journalistic to engage in the defense of basic information and speech rights. And one of the things that's frustrated me in the US is that I see very little organization among journalists to uh, defend either access to information or speech rights in an organized way. Individual organizations, individual reporters uh, do that work. But the idea that it's journalistic to defend information infrastructure and information rights um, uh, and that you can do that more effectively if uh, as a trade um, you speak to the regulatory environment, the culture, the practice around information and speech rights. Um, people are very uncomfortable with that here and I think they need to get comfortable with it. There are tremendous resources in organizing in that way. Um, and, and in any place where you have a place that's broadly democratic but under pressure, um, you, you, you can make extraordinary progress um, by doing that work. And we certainly were able to do that in South Africa, both in relation to efforts to create a press tribunal, in relation to new uh, classification legislation, um, and in a host of ways around things like uh, stock exchange disclosures um, and those kinds of rules, which are really, really fundamental. Um, so I think um, what's, what's hopeful about the South African case is not just hanging in there until the change comes, you know, and nudging it, but actually some pretty clear moves that were made very deliberately, um, both to shore up the, the underlying environment um, and to collaborate uh, in a way that allowed for a very high impact publishing moment uh, that was trusted. So Marsha, you've written a lot about autocracy here in the US and um, Donald Trump and so forth. But the truth is that Donald Trump was very good for investigative reporting. Right? There's been exemplary investigations that have been inspired by or taken place despite Trump. But at the same time, he's bad for the media in so many respects. I mean, how do we, you know, how do you put those two paradoxical things together? What, what do we make of this moment for journalism? You know, I think we have to admit, and it sounds very simple, but I think that uh, this is something that, you know, all my years of living under an autocracy taught me 
Um, we have to admit that autocracy is bad for journalism. It's always a net loss. Okay. Uh, a, a lying president is an existential threat to journalism. Uh, a lack of access to information is a net loss for, journal, for journalists. Right? A lack of transparency is always a net loss to journalists. Even the very predicament of amplifying the president's lies every time we reported them, uh, report on them, no matter how well we frame them as lies, right? Even that is a net loss for journalism. You know, when um, when we're reduced to reporting on a presidency that is that is lying, that is corrupting, that is corrosive, that is destructive to the idea of government as such, all of those things are bad for for journalism, right? So I try to think of journalism uh, under Donald Trump as, as a harm reduction project. So there's going to be harm, right? How do we reduce the net amount of harm done? And I think there are some ways, uh, and, and, and Sheila, you, you alluded to some of them, you know, there have been not just really incredible investigations, but really groundbreaking collaborative models, which is also something that Nick talked about, right? where we see, I mean, my absolute favorite example uh, is the Trump Inc. podcast, which I think does everything right, right? They do, they do it right because it's a collaborative project. So they involve ProPublica, which is a nonprofit investigative journalism foundation, WNYC, which is a radio station and various print outlets. So it's a variety of platforms, but it's also a number of different uh, journalists with, with different organizations working on this project. The other thing that I love about them is that it's an ongoing project and they frame it as an open investigation, right? So they're asking the question uh, and they have working hypotheses that, that transform over time, but they realize that it's never going to end, right? Um, and I think that, you know, that like listening to them, one can forget what a revolutionary thing it is for journalism to frame your project as an open-ended one. But I think it's it's brilliant. And then the third thing is that they they explicitly frame their project as a, as an a, as trying to describe Trumpism as a system, right? Um, so in no single investigation can do that, but you can try uh, put the puzzle together as as you do things. And but trying to describe it as a system means context, history, framing, right? All the things that uh, that help us reduce harm in general. Now that we're in the topic of our favorite investigations conducted under trying and challenging circumstances, maybe I'd, I'd like to ask before we open this up for quest to questions, Lena and Nick to describe briefly what they think are exemplary types of investigations that have been done about autocracy. Lena. Um, I'd like to cite this one example. Uh, obviously we've done several uh, over the last Yes, I like to mention this one example of um, of um, an investigation we did about uh, about uh, uh, um, corruption and spending within the presidential the presidential palaces during the Mubarak era, um, and I like to cite this example because uh, um, it it it's connected to questions of uh, impact and audience building. Um, it was. Uh, a very data-driven uh, investigation that is also told in very compelling ways. Um, and here I'd like to also think of how we can appropriate the idea of compelling narrative. We can also tell compelling narratives with the information and with the data and, uh, and, um, and be quite convincing with the information that we have. And what I love about this, this, uh, this story that we did is that we also included um, in the metadata some databases uh, some originals um, databases that basically explain how the spending works um, in the presidential palaces. And we we were surprised that oh, the, the readers not only read the piece, but were the, they went into the databases and they started making comments about the, 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 the raw data, the data sets that we provided. And it just, you know, gave us this, um, this trust in uh, how thirsty people are for well-served, well-produced uh, journalism. And, you know, if it's anything, it's a call to respect our readers and to give them 
more of that. So, um, so yeah, just wanted to share that. Yes. Yeah, one of the things we haven't really talked about is how you investigate the marriage between autocracy and kleptocracy. Nick, what was what's your favorite um, investigation? Well, funnily enough, in the piece that I did for GIJ, and I, I specifically wrote about the Trump Inc. podcast precisely because of that combination of collaboration and because it links autocracy and kleptocracy. Um, and I, I think that's a, a theme we could stand to draw out more maybe during question time, because I think it's a theme that enables audiences very strongly to associate the ills of autocratic and demagogic leadership with, with the, the way in which it always ends up being about the, the, the bank accounts and interests of, of ruling elites. Um, so I really would encourage people who haven't uh, had a listen to Trump Inc. to, 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 to do that. It also works across uh, jurisdictional boundaries sometimes and um, uh, frames the questions in a very interesting way. I'll mention a couple of other things that I think you know, may not be great blockbusters of reporting, but, but illustrate some of the things that I think are necessary right now. I think if you look at the work that um, Brandy Zadrozny and Ben Collins have done for NBC on the origins of uh, the QAnon cult, um, which has involved really deep uh, plumbing uh, work inside of 4chan and 8chan and, and, and right-wing message boards. Um, and, and that's looked at the infosphere of uh, pollution that, that we're dealing with and developed you know, both a sensibility and a sort of technique and a sourcing network to understand um, the, the way that all of that works and to trace it back to its roots. I think that points to, um, to some very important skills that people need to add now. So in addition to your kind of classical financial forensic skills, you need these informationally forensic skills um, to understand the current uh, infosphere. Also to trace um, the both formal and just mimetic links between um, nodes in the anti-democratic global network, whether it's, um, you know, um, obvious collaboration of the kind we see with Nigel Farage pitching up in, you know, in, in the US or Steve Bannon organizing conferences in Italian hotels, or just, you know, Trump imitating Duterte because he, he likes what he sees. Um, so I think, I think that set of kind of informational forensic skills is, is really important. The other, the other, the other thing that I think um, is, has been quite exemplary recently has been the work of the Wall Street Journal on Facebook in India, um, you know, digging into the ways in which uh, Facebook's public policy head in, in India, Anki Das, who um, quit yesterday, uh, finally, was clearly ensuring that uh, right-wing hate speech in India remained up on the platform and was and the interests of the ruling party were massaged and looked after. And that's important, not just because of what it tells us about um, the democratic sphere in India, but because of what it tells us about global information infrastructure um, and the way that it's being captured, distorted, managed in the interests of, of both a demag demagogic and a kleptocratic set of projects. So we have, that's the other thing we haven't talked about is the global links of, of all of the of platforms of autocrats and kleptocrats, global financial links, information links, political links, but we don't have the time. And so I'd like to call on Eunice now to, to um, yeah, give us questions from the audience that are then uh, deployed to the panel. Okay, yes. let's start with yeah. two questions. Uh, the first one, democracies are voting into power autocrats. Should journalists spend their time telling voters that in effect, democracy is on the ballot in these elections? And the second question, it is widely thought that Trumpism will do long-term damage to US democratic institutions. Should Trump get reelected, what is the speaker's advice to American journalists for the next four years? Okay, maybe we should we should start with the second question and pose that to Masha. Advice to journalists for another four years of this. Um, thank you, and yeah, I'm I'm going to have to, uh, but goodbye as soon as I'm finished answering. Unfortunately, um, well, that's the hardest question there is. Uh, you know, I think that if Trump secures another term, whether by winning the election or by muddying up the election by hijacking the election, which is much more likely than an outright win at this point, right? um, then we have passed through what 
the Hungarian political scientist Balint Magyar calls autocratic breakthrough, right? So right now we're in a stage of autocratic attempt uh, and then we pass through autocratic breakthrough into autocratic consolidation, which probably means that at that point autocracy is no longer reversible by electoral means. Because again, most likely he would secure a second term by um, doing enough damage to the already extremely problematic American electoral system to be able to, uh, to hijack the vote, right? Um, and that damage will only be consolidated. And so elections will become like elections in other autocracies, uh, you know, a, a fruitless ritual or at least a highly problematic um, ritual. <clears throat> And I think that does turn the press into an opposition party in the very simple sense that the press are an institution of democracy, right? It is possible to have media, to have, to, to have good, good journalism in a non-democratic country. It is not possible to have a democracy without good journalism, right? And so our battle to maintain good journalism will be a battle for democracy in a non-democratic state, right? And that means, I think, re, uh, reconsidering some of the ways in which we approach the administration. In particular, I would say we would have to reconsider language. You know, I think that at this point, there are a lot of problematic ways in which we sort of automatically normalize the Trump administration. For example, when we talk about strategies or policy priorities, right? Words that are normal in, uh, in political discourse, but that are normalizing when applied to an abnormal administration. By abnormal, I mean something very specific, right? This is an administration that is hell bent on actually destroying government, right? So when we call destruction a strategy, we're normalizing the process of destruction, right? When we call the decimation of the State Department diplomacy, we're normalizing the decimation of the State Department. So I think we'll have to be much more mindful about the way that we use language, uh, again, with an eye to the future, because we will need that language, right? The language of government, the language of policy, the language of politics, of how we figure out how we live together in a state um, and, a, and a country. Um, we will need that language in a, in a, in a post-autocratic future. Thank you. Thank you for your eloquence and thank you for joining us today. And we'll continue reading you. It's great to see you. Um, I'd like thank to pose th this, this question to, this questions to Lina and Nick. The, most of the autocrats of today were, you know, we've seen India, we've seen South Africa, Philippines were democratically elected, right? And they have people's votes behind them. And, and so what, what do we do about that? When people seem to prefer populist leaders, no matter how anti-democratic or how demagogic they are, what's, what's the press to do? Nick, okay, Nick and then Lena, yeah. I think that, you know, one of the things we have to remember is that we should not have a naive idea of democracy, not have an idea that democracy is simply about you know, what um, one event every four or five years tells us about who gets to be the leader. Democra democratic norms, a democratic structure uh, requires a whole set of other things, critically people's rights. And I think that for journalism to stand on the side of democracy is also to stand on the side of people's rights. Um, so while we may accept uh, and, and ought to accept uh, where, where, where it's the case that a autocratic leaning leader is legitimately elected. There are a whole range of other things that we should be reporting on and continuing to build pressure around about the way that people's rights are um, both respected and ultimately realized uh, under that person's leadership. There's a whole set of laws um, and standards that we should be holding them to account against. So I think the sort of notion that, or the worry that people have that somehow um, the legitimacy of, of an election puts beyond reproach the conduct of a demagogic leader is, is, 
to, is to allow ourselves to fall into a very naive and convenient idea of democracy. And it's important that we not do that. And that's one of the reasons to go back to my earlier point that we have to continue kind of, you know, telling our readers what it is that we're doing um, and thinking in our story triage um, and our choices about where we put our, our effort, whether it's investigative or imaginative. And I loved uh, some of the things that Lena um, talked about in terms of keeping the idea of a sort of civic world alive, um, telling them sometimes quite straightforwardly uh, what we're doing in relation to the perceived legitimacy um, of an elected leader. Lena, have we been naive about democracy? I, I totally agree that there is definitely this obsession with ballot boxes as, you know, the, the you know, ultimate and sort of momentous uh, definer of, uh, of, uh, of democracy. And as Nick said, every, every few years, um, and, uh, and, you know, one of, uh, one of the things we, we claim a right for is to basically also appropriate the broader and more expansive meaning of, of democracy as something that's far more open, uh, something that encompasses ideas of criticality, of, of being progressive. Um, and, and, and this is basically uh, what we are interested in um, as, you know, as that parallel force uh, to, the, to, to the ballot box, basically. So that parallel force that is here every day, not every few years, and that is engaging with the reality of the everyday and and, you know, uh, engaging with it critically um, and at times also imaginatively. So we feel that, um, you know, the ballot box is, is only one part of the one part of the reality and it's highly debatable, you know, what, um, you know, what makes uh, what, what makes it such a reality in, in such a way in different contexts. And I don't need to get into the, the details of, of here. Um, but the other part of the reality is the, the so many days and, and months separating every, um, every election from the other. And it's within that space that we operate. And there's much to be said about democracy within that space as well. We're talking a lot about space here. Eunice, um, are there more questions? Oh, yes, there are a bunch more uh, good <laughs> questions. I hope we have time to get to them all. So uh, let me go to two more questions. The first one, in the US and Poland, the right is packing the courts to achieve rule of law that they couldn't accomplish through the legislature. So what is the role of journalists in reporting on this kind of changes? And number two, how can a newsroom reach all sectors of society and not just an elite group of reformers? If uh, Nick and Lena can, are there any examples of journalism exposing issues which led to reform or change in Egypt or South Africa? Um, Nick? Okay, two very, two very different issues, I suppose. I mean, I think, I think that, um, you know, the question around uh, the capture of courts um, is really the kind of place where thinking about your story tree are saying, okay, well, this is a core piece of what a functioning democracy needs. And we need to be on top of that and reporting that is absolutely crucial. And we've seen that, yeah, in, in, in Poland, we've seen it in Israel, um, in, in, in a different way, frankly, we've seen it in the US. Um, uh, and, and part of what's had to happen in the US is for journalists to stop normalizing a set of practices that are not about securing the legitimacy and independence um, of the court. So I think um, also explaining to readers the dynamics of how a court comes to be, how appointments work, what um, what kind of legal qualification and appropriateness looks like. A lot of this stuff is shrouded in mystique. Um, a lot of the issues around the individual records and personas and so on. Court reporting is unfortunately um, not as strong as it used to be many places. Um, so I think I think there's there is a, a really important focus many places um, to apply there. Um, you know, just very briefly on, on reaching beyond elites, I think something we didn't talk about enough, and this should have fallen under the headache both of trust, but also of investigative effectiveness, is that newsrooms first have to also look a bit less elite themselves. Very often newsrooms, and frankly, especially investigative newsrooms, reflect um, the dominant classes, castes, races, genders, 
um, of of the, of the place they're in. Certainly in South Africa, investigative journalism was was not anymore, but was a pretty white uh, sector. You know, in India, newsrooms are overwhelmingly surveys complete consistently show overwhelmingly Brahmin. Uh, you know, we know the situation in the U.S. And I think that newsroom leaders, especially investigative leaders, need to pay real attention um, to uh, diversity in their teams, both in terms of their ability to find and report uh, stories uh, and in their ability to have a social license to operate and to reach audiences who recognize themselves in the work. Lena? Uh, I'll address the question of uh, reaching out to um, audiences uh, in a way that's not, uh, yeah, elite oriented. Uh, it's it's of course hard when a lot of your content is in text and in in long form text, and a lot of the times because also that's a form that we feel very strongly about. Uh, but I also feel that speaking of space, trying to go with the coverage to different spaces. Um, it does give a sense um, of, of uh, care and attention uh, to different communities um, that are not uh, amongst the, the usual suspects, as I said uh, at the beginning of the, of the panel. So, for example, we do a lot of work um, about the Sinai Peninsula, uh, which, which is a place that's uh, witnessing a major insurrection of um, was was you know armed militants um, in war with uh, the state and the military for years now, um, and the civilians being caught in the middle in very dire living uh, conditions, and it's something that we report about repeatedly. We never we like even though it's that state of exception has become the new normal, uh, we haven't really stopped telling stories about. Um, about the situation there, and I feel that this has also drawn attention from um, from this from these marginalized communities um, to 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 the work we do. So I guess going to space is important is important for for the question of um, yeah is important for the question of of um, of reaching out and not being um, limited to specific centralized audiences. Um, we are running out of time, so I think we need we need to put this to a close. There are so many things still we, that we could have discussed, and I really want to thank our stellar panel, Lena, Marsha, and Nick, for their eloquence, their insights, their courage, and their work. Very big thank you to, to the three of you. And finally, to the audience, we hope you can join us for our next GIJN seminar on investigating sexual abuse. That's going to be on Thursday, November 12th at 9 EST. Watch our Twitter feed at GIJN and calendar for details on future events. Once again, thank you everyone for joining us and thank you to our excellent speakers and goodbye everyone and see you in the next webinar.